Welcome back to Downing Street for today's daily coronavirus briefing. I'm joined by Sir Patrick Valance, the government's chief scientific advisor, and Professor John Newton, who is coordinating our work on testing. The government is working through our action plan, which has as its core that we must protect life and protect the NHS, both by slowing the spread of the virus so that we flatten the curve and by ensuring that the NHS is always there to treat all people who need its care. According to the most recent figures, 583,496 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out in the UK, including 23,560 tests carried out yesterday. 138,078 people have tested positive for the virus. That's an increase of 4,583 cases since yesterday. 17,615 people have sadly died. 17,615 people, sorry, are currently in hospital, I correct myself, with coronavirus, down from 18,189 on the 21st of April. And sadly, of those hospitalized, 18,738 have now died. And that is an increase of 616 fatalities since yesterday. And although this number is lower than it has been in previous days, I still stop and think of each one. They will not be forgotten and their stories will live on. We must maintain our resolve and follow the social distancing rules because they are working, they are protecting the NHS, and they are saving lives. To lift the measures too soon and to risk a second peak would be a mistake. It would undo all of the hard work that's been done. And it would be both bad for our nation's health and for our nation's economy. We can only start to change the measures when the NHS can continue to cope, when the operational challenges have been met, when the daily death rate falls sustainably and consistently, when the rate of infection is decreasing, and most importantly, when there's no risk of a second peak. We need to bring the incidence of new infection right down. We'll then use a rigorous program of test, track and trace and keep it down so we can safely release more of the restrictions. And today I want to set out the progress that we're making on test, track and trace, which is such an important part of the measures that we're taking and the work that we're doing. First, testing. We set the goal of 100,000 tests per day by the end of this month. I knew when we set it that this was a challenging target. Capacity is now ahead of our plans and even overnight has increased from 40,000 to 51,000. And because capacity has increased so substantially, we're now able to expand who can get the tests. Our ultimate goal is that everyone who could benefit from a test gets a test. But of course, we had to start by prioritizing patients in hospital, followed by NHS and social care colleagues and by those in care homes. As we expanded the capacity from just 2,000 tests a day at the start of March to 10,000 tests a day at the start of this month, so we've been able to further expand access. Today, I can go further. We can make it easier, faster, and simpler for any essential worker in England who needs a test to get a test. From today, employers of essential workers who will, will be able to go on gov.uk to get a test for any of their staff who need a test. And from tomorrow, any essential workers who need a test will be able to book an appointment on gov.uk themselves directly. This all applies for people in essential workers' households too who need a test. It's all part of getting Britain back on her feet. Those included as essential workers will be based on the list for schools and education, 
set out on gov.uk. The whole process will be free. And once you've entered your details on the website, you'll get a text or an email inviting you to book an appointment. After you've had your test, results will be sent out by text and a help desk will be available to deal with queries. People who can't go online can still apply through their employer. I want to make it as easy as possible for people to get a test, not least because we're talking about people who are ill. Our network of regional test sites has now reached over 30 locations right across the UK and more are being set up each day. And I just want to take this moment to applaud the private companies who've been involved, as well as my team and the team in Public Health in England and the NHS. Boots, Amazon, Thermo Fisher, Randox, Roche, Oxford Nanopore, GSK and AstraZeneca, they've really stepped up to the mark and I'm grateful to each and every one. We're also introducing home test kits and with the support of the armed forces, mobile testing sites too. The armed forces and the MOD have played a vital role here and I want to pay tribute to their work. I thought that at yesterday's briefing, General Sir Nick Carter, when he said that coronavirus had presented the single greatest logistical challenge in his 40 years of service, I thought that spoke a truth. Our armed forces have played their part in rising to this challenge and I want to thank them all. In addition to testing essential workers, we're also using testing to find out how many people have coronavirus and how many people have had coronavirus. These are critical pieces of information to inform our battle against this novel virus and that we'll use to learn and we keep learning about every day. This week we've begun one of the biggest virus infection and antibody studies that this country has ever seen. This is a joint project with the Office for National Statistics bringing their experience of running large household surveys and the University of Oxford bringing their world-leading scientific expertise. In total, 25,000 people will take part in the first phase, with plans to expand it to up to 300,000 people over the next 12 months. Participants will provide regular samples taken from self-administered swabs and answer a few short questions during home visits by trained health workers. We'll use these tests to help us strengthen our scientific understanding and inform us on the big choices that we have to make about social distancing measures and how we start returning to a more normal life. Letters are arriving on doorsteps from today. Please, if you're asked, take part in this vital research for your country. The early signs from today are that there is huge enthusiasm for those who've received letters taking part in this survey. If you get a letter, please respond to it as soon as you can because you will be doing your bit. As we ramp up our ability to test in large numbers and as we slow the spread of the virus, we also need to make sure we've got the ability to trace contacts just as effectively. As we look ahead, this is critical to keep the virus under control. And so we're putting the infrastructure in place now so that we can roll out contact tracing on a large scale. We're currently testing the new NHS contact tracing app if you become unwell with symptoms of coronavirus, you'll be able to tell the NHS via this app. The app will then send an alert to other app users that you've been in significant contact with in recent days, even before you had the symptoms, so that they know and they can act accordingly so we can get the test to people even if they're asymptomatic. If we're worried that they have a signif they've been in significant uh, contact with someone who has the disease, we'll be able to let them know. But it's not just about the technology. We need the people too. We need to be really kick-starting contact tracing as the new number of cases begins to fall. We're preparing for this now by hiring an initial 18,000 people, including over 3,000 clinicians, including public health specialists. We'll be training up the massed ranks of our contact tracers over the coming weeks and roll out the service. This test, track and trace will be vital to stop a second peak of the virus. But recent weeks have shown that there is something we can all do. And that's to follow the rules on social distancing. I am acutely aware of how difficult this has been. And especially as we enter Ramadan, a month 
that is so special for so many people. This Ramadan, many Muslims who serve their country in the NHS and in the armed forces and in so many other ways will not be sharing the joy of this month as they normally do. I want to say to all British Muslims, thank you for staying at home. I know how important the daily iftar is, how important communal prayers are at night, and how important the Eid festival is. Thank you for making major changes to these vital parts of your practice. And I want to say to you all, Ramadan Mubarak. And thank you for your service and citizenship and thank you for your sacrifice. This will help so that we can together emerge from this challenge all the more united, all the more grateful to one another, and all the more safe. We've traveled together too far to go backwards now. So please stay at home, protect the NHS, and save lives. I'm now going to ask um, Sir Patrick to set out the latest data on the charts. Thank you very much. Can I have the first slide, please? A reminder on this slide that this virus spreads between people when we get too close, when we have coughs, when we exchange because of contact. All of us have done a good job, actually, at staying away from multiple contacts. And you can see on this slide, actually 90% or more in some cases, people have stayed away from um, people outside the household. We've tried to avoid contact with vulnerable people, however difficult that has been, but it has made a big difference. You can also see that actually the number of people who've managed to work from home has actually increased. So that has been a really important part of making sure that we reduce the chance of this virus spreading. And it's very clear that actually the transmission in the community is way down from what it was. So in terms of the infection spread amongst the population, the social distancing is having a very big effect. Next slide, please. This shows new cases, but I've said this before and I'll say it again. This is new cases as determined by testing. And uh, there are many more cases, but we know that those cases are coming down. Here it looks fairly flat because it's the testing uh, slide. What you can see here, though, is that the number of people who are being tested in, for medical reasons in blue is coming down slightly even on this, even though there are many more tests being done. And of course, it's now possible to test a number of essential workers in the orange bar. But the real acid test is what's this turning into in terms of the effects. Next slide, please. This is the number of people in hospital with COVID. And here you can see a very clear decline in London. You can see that in other areas there are declines, such as in the Midlands, and you can see in nearly all areas this is flat or on the way down. So this speaks to the point that as we've radically reduced the number of infections in the community, this has turned into a reduction in the number in, ho in hospital. We're still at that period coming through the peak, but you can see it's headed very much in the right direction. This, in turn, with a delay, translates into what happens in intensive care units. Next slide, please. And intensive care units, you can see here the percentage of beds being occupied. You can see that the number went up, of course, reached a plateau, and is gradually decreasing. And as I've said before, you'd expect this to be a gradual decline and to take longer than the decrease in admissions. I do want to say one other thing about what's happening in hospitals, though. There is a very large clinical trial going on, trying to work out which medicines may make a difference in this disease. And one of those studies has recruited 7,000 patients, and there'll be results coming out from that in due course. I would just urge, as we enter the phase where the plateau has been reached, slight decrease we can see, we continue to make sure that we enroll patients in clinical trials so that we get the answers to the critical questions about which medicines may work. Final slide, please. Not surprisingly, we know this is a, a, a problem in terms of the severity of the disease, that although the number of patients in intensive care units is coming down slowly, the deaths remain at a plateau, coming down slightly, not coming down fast. 
I would expect that to continue for another couple of weeks and we will then see a faster decline thereafter. It's crucially important, going back to the beginning, that we all keep firm with our attention to social distancing because it's at that end that we stop the progression through hospital intensive care unit and ultimately, unfortunately, for some people to death. And I think it's crucial that we all do our part to keep this going and you can see it's headed in the right direction and we must stay firm with the measures we're taking. Thanks very much. Uh, John, if you'd update us on where we are on, uh, on the testing programme in a bit more detail. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, I want to use this opportunity to talk about the why and the what of our national testing programme. Why do we need it and what are we doing to make sure everyone who would benefit from a test can get one? I should first explain, when we talk about testing, we're talking about two different types of tests. The first type is a swab test for the presence of the virus. The second type is a blood test to show who has previously had the virus. Swab testing is currently our main focus because relatively few people have had the virus at this point in the pandemic. Swab tests can tell us what treatment the patient should receive when they come into hospital, who needs to be isolated in any care service, and which key workers who are currently self-isolating can safely return to work. And some two-thirds of those that we've been testing have returned to work, which is very gratifying. And we've seen some reductions in the NHS sickness absence results as a result. In hospitals or care homes where social distancing is more difficult to achieve, testing is vital to help control outbreaks of infection where they occur. And finally, swab tests can help us understand the spread of the disease across the population through carefully designed surveys of the type that Secretary of State just described, the one led by uh, the Office of National Statistics and Oxford University. Now, although a positive swab test is very reliable, I want to stress that a negative result does not absolutely guarantee that you are free of the virus. It is, however, a very good guide for whether it's safe to return to work. Blood testing, by contrast, can tell us who has previously had the infection again improving our understanding of the spread of the virus when used in surveys. And in individuals, it may also be able to tell us about the risks of future infection, which of course is so important. Now, if you have had the virus, you may have acquired some degree of immunity. I stress may because the science on immunity is still uncertain. And in any case, it also takes some time for that immunity to build up and for the test to be positive. Our five-pillar national testing program is, decide, is designed to ensure that everyone who needs a test can have one. To make that happen, we're doing two things, increasing capacity for testing and increasing access. May I have the first slide, please, on testing? Here we can see that, as Secretary of State said, we've now performed more than 500,000 tests uh, in the UK, which is... Uh, and that's been steadily increasing over time. If I could have the second slide, please. This slide shows the increase in the capacity to undertake tests. And we're talking here about the swab tests. And compared to the start of the month, you can see that we have increased substantially so that we can now do more than 51,000 tests a day. And the shape of the curve is exponential. You can see that it's rapidly increasing at this point, which is what we expected. Now, we've done this by securing supplies of kits and consumables from some of the leading manufacturers uh, that Secretary of State mentioned. And now these are the very best of their kind available in the world. We've also introduced new tests, new types of tests. So at least, for example, at least two NHS labs are now using a test that has no RNA extraction stage which means no, uh, no need for the chemical reagents, which are in such high demand around the world. And we've also developed technology within the NHS to direct capacity to where it's needed most, and that's made a huge difference. In addition, we have the three new lighthouse labs, which are all now on stream. These are the ones in Milton Keynes, in Manchester, and in Glasgow. Each of these labs will be able to process tens of thousands of tests per day. And we're introducing automation into those processes, which, is, which really ramps up the capacity. We've also entered into partnerships with leading labs in industry and academia, in addition to these other labs I've mentioned already. 
and this will help increase volume still further. So we are currently on track to reach 100,000 tests per day as planned. In fact, we're somewhat ahead of where we thought we'd be at this stage. Now, a huge amount of work has gone into this across the board, and I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone involved. Next, we're increasing access to testing. So if I could have the, the next slide, please. So you can see here from the map particularly, we already have uh, more than 30 drive-through centers, and these are increasing to around 48. As the Secretary of State mentioned, home testing option is also now in place, and we will increase this further. We also want to use an approach we call a satellite approach, where tests can, test kits are delivered in batches to a single site and then returned in batches. And then finally, uh, the, as, you, uh, as you heard, we are also currently working with the Army on a new pop-up mobile testing option, which was uh, developed for us by the Army and is really working very well. So we have, we're going to have 48 of these pop-up facilities which can travel around the country to where they're needed most, for example, in care homes. Now, a key development that will transform access is this new uh, web, the web portals for employers and for essential workers to refer themselves for a test. All of this together means that any essential worker or member of their household who has symptoms and would benefit from a test will be able to get one. At the same time, we are developing new and better blood tests. Now, these could be used to help people assess their individual risk, although, as I've said, the science on this is incomplete. And the existing tests on the market do not work well enough for individual advice. In fact, no country in the world is using them for that purpose. The existing tests can, however, be used with care in surveys to understand the spread of the virus. So just like our national effort on vaccines, the UK's top scientists are working with industry and the NHS to develop better blood tests. We've made good progress and several candidate tests are now being evaluated. Once we've identified the accurate tests, they can be provided in labs in large quantities relatively easily, much more easy to scale up than the swab tests. And fi finally, a public-private consortium, the UK Rapid Test Consortium, is working on a method of getting antibody tests to people at home. So, of course, all this testing capacity is needed now, but not just now, also for the future, to support the government's strategy as we move to the next stage of the response to the pandemic. In the coming weeks and months, as you've heard from Secretary of State, we will need testing to keep the virus under control with a test, track and trace program. We will also need, as I've mentioned, intensive testing in settings like hospitals and care homes, including of people who may not have symptoms, to prevent spread, protect staff, and save lives. And finally, we'll need testing capacity to support these large repeated surveys of population to assess the ongoing situation. So let me summarize the current state of play as far as testing goes. We have exponentially increased our testing capacity and we are on target to have capacity for 100,000 tests a day. We're opening up access so that all essential workers and members of their household who have symptoms and could benefit from a test can get one. At the same time, as we've heard from Sir Patrick, the success of social distancing has almost certainly reduced the number of people who would benefit from a, stage, from a test at this stage of the, of the pandemic. Perhaps most important, though, is that as we move to the next phase of the response to the pandemic, I can say with confidence that we will have the testing capability that we need. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Um, and uh, now we'll open up to questions. The first question, Laura Koonsberg of the BBC. Um, thank you very much, Secretary of State. Um, there is broad public support for the lockdown, but the Scottish First Minister, the opposition, and some of your own MPs think you should be more transparent about what might come next. Are they all wrong? Because the five tests you've set out are all about when it might be time, but not about how we might move on into that next phase. And if I could ask Sir Patrick, um, what do you think the gap between the peaks in terms of time could be in different parts of the country? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Laura. Well, I understand the uh, thirst for uh, knowledge, uh, but the, the tests that we've set out, which are the... Uh, the basis from which uh, others, for instance, uh, the Scottish Government, uh, have then uh, developed their plans. Those tests are the critical tests for 
when changes can be made. Uh, and of course, you know, monitoring what's happening and making sure that we move at the right time is absolutely critical. Um, but the message remains to your viewers and to everybody across the country, the message remains the same, that people need to stay at home to protect the NHS and save lives. And the reason that we have clarity on that message is that it has succeeded in bringing down and flattening the curve, but we are not through that yet. And there's an awful lot of work that still needs to be done, and we're absolutely determined to avoid a second peak. Um, so we've set out, uh, precisely as you say, uh, the five tests for when uh, we should uh, move. We haven't met them yet, and therefore we must keep the social distancing measures in place. Patrick. It's worth remembering that, that what we've done is really suppress the numbers. So this isn't a natural peak. This is a suppressed, uh, suppressed peak. Um, and I think London is ahead of the rest of the country, maybe by a couple of weeks, but there's quite a lot of synchrony right across the country, actually. It's not massively different. So I can't be absolutely sure about this, but I think two or three weeks is, is the sort of order where you might expect to see some differences across the country. Thanks very much. Uh, Robert Peston, ITV. I'm back on that. Thanks, Robert. Hello. Um, good afternoon. A um, co couple of quick ones. Um, f first of all, um, if you look at the ICNARC intensive care surveys, uh, it does seem that people who are over overweight are more at risk of becoming acutely ill. But being overweight is not something that on the whole you talk about as a, as a risk factor. Is being overweight a risk factor? And secondly, um, just to Sir Patrick, it wasn't that long ago, Sir Patrick, that you said 20,000 deaths would be a good result. It's very clear there are going to be more than 20,000 deaths. This is not a blame thing, but what have you learned about this virus and how it's behaving that explains why it's going to be considerably more than 20,000 deaths? Uh, and do you have a sense of, in this phase, how many deaths we're likely to see? Uh, thanks, Robert. I'll ask uh, John to answer the first and Patrick to answer the second. Yes, thank you, Secretary of State. Um, well, yes, Robert, so the, the data you mentioned uh, showed a number of differences between the characteristics of people receiving care for uh, coronavirus and the general population. In fact, Secretary of State has asked Public Health England to undertake a detailed piece of research to look into this, working with academic mm -hmm. colleagues. So we're certainly looking at the relationship between uh, obesity and outcomes, but also a number of other factors such as ethnicity, uh, age and gender even are uh, all important factors. Um, so there's, a, uh, there's, uh, there's quite a lot of work to do. There are, um, there are some, uh, in the data that, that we have, uh, there are some uh, techniques to try and assess by linkage and so on how important these differences are. So there's a certain amount of statistical work to do, um, but there's the, the, it should be possible to get an answer to some of those questions reasonably soon. Thanks very much. Patrick? In a way, your, your first question, to some extent, answers the second one. There's a lot we don't know about this virus. I mean, it's odd that you see this obesity signal. It's odd that it's got such a gender difference. There are lots of things about this new virus that we don't understand. There are lots of things that are being learned quite fast. There are lots of things that we need to understand about the immunity to it. Um, in terms of the uh, numbers of deaths, I think it's difficult to speculate exactly what that will look like at the end of this. It's very clear that there have been um, large numbers right the way across the world. And I think the key statistic that we need to look at going forward is the overall excess deaths, which encompasses direct and indirect, as the CMO has laid out repeatedly. So I'm not, I'm not going to try and put a number on that. Uh, clearly, uh, every death is, is absolutely regrettable and affects many people, and our job is to try to make sure we suppress this as far as we can and keep those numbers down. Thanks very much. Uh, Beth Rigby at Sky. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, Mr. Hancock, first a question for you. Does a proper scaled up testing and tracing system have to be up and running before you're even countenance easing the lockdown? And if so, can you get that ready by May the 7th? Uh, and to Sir Patrick, if I may, do you intend to establish what you think is a toler tolerable level of community transmission based on not overwhelming the NHS? So allowing some spread of the virus through the population, or is your aim to push 
daily new cases as low as possible to control the virus? Well, uh, thanks. I, I, both of those questions are, are for ultimately for politicians because they are the big judgments. I'll ask Patrick to comment on the science of the latter, uh, but ultimately the judgments are made uh, by the... Uh, uh, by the, the cabinet on the advice of the uh, scientists. Um, on, on the first, there is no automatic link between the two. Um, there is no automatic link between the scale of test, track and trace uh, and, the, um, uh, and any changes um, to the social distancing measures. So I wouldn't put a, a deadline on it in the way that you did. What I would say is that test, track and trace can done effectively can help to suppress the transmission in a way that allows you then to have lesser social distancing uh, rules. Um, and critically, test, track and trace works more effectively when the rate of new cases is lower. So the lower the rate of new cases, the more effectively you can keep it down using test, track and trace rather than having to use heavier uh, social distancing measures. So the link between the two is, in fact, that once you have full-blown uh, tracking and, and tracing with the test capacity that, uh, as John set out, uh, we're increasing, uh, that allows you to, uh, to hold down at the, level of trans the, the level of transmission um, and under lesser so social distancing rules, but you've got to get it down there first for test, track, and trace to be effective. And that comes to the second point, which is that our objective is to get the rate of transmission down, and that seems to have happened because instead of an exponential rise, as we saw before, we now see a flattening of the curve. And then, crucially, to get the level of transmission down, as in the number of new cases, we, so it's both about the rate of change and the level. So it appears that we have got the rate, the R figure, the rate of transmission um, lower because we are, we've flattened the curve. Um, but we've got to see the number of cases as well come down because then you can use test, track and trace to hold it down. Um, so that's the way that those two things fit together, and it all, it, it, it's all part of a piece, and both of your questions are entirely tied to each other, which is why it become, all of this becomes a strategic question uh, rather than purely a scientific question, but it is, of course, based on the science. Patrick, does that...? Absolutely right. I mean, we, we advised on what measures needed to be put in place to keep the numbers down below NHS critical care capacity. That was absolutely crucial and it looks like that has been um, achieved um, and therefore that's one really important step and we are advising now on what measures need to be in place in order to get those numbers lower for the reasons the Secretary of State said uh, and uh, what numbers uh, are necessary in order to get down to uh, trace and, and, and uh, sort of test track and trace approaches. Um, but the decision on, on how far to go and which measures uh, should be released and so on are ones for Ministers. Thanks very much, Beth. Uh, ben Kentish from LBC. Thank you, Secretary of State. Everyone agrees that the contact, the track and trace method that you've been talking about is going to be very important in the coming weeks. So I wondered if I could just ask you to give us a few specifics. Uh, how many of those 18,000 uh, tracers are in place? When do you think you need to get to the 18,000? Uh, how low, roughly, do case numbers need to be before track and trace can start to be in any way effective yeah. and just a second uh, question if i may on science and face masks we were behind other countries in going into lockdown we've been behind other countries in scaling up our testing capacity and it seems we're behind other countries in uh, the use of face masks when i asked about this two weeks ago for example that there was no effective it seems and that advice may change is there a sense, though, that we are a bit slow compared to other countries in following the science and a risk that that delay might mean, given other countries have been buying face masks for their citizens for many weeks now, that there's a problem when it comes to British people having access, given international shortages, to effective protection face masks? Uh, thanks very much. So on the first question, uh, we're recruiting now uh, and we need to 
Uh, we've set out in the first instance that we're recruiting uh, 18,000, of whom 3,000 will be clinical personnel, um, and um, train up the other uh, 15,000. That process is, um, is ongoing. Um, and in terms of when it'll be ready, uh, it's in a matter of weeks. Um, and um, that will then you know, help, but critically it's needed when we get the level of transmission down. On the second question, we've discussed the timings uh, many times before. I don't accept the premise of the question because um, the, uh, we followed the science um, throughout this, building on that, uh, that, that science. Um, and the science develops as we learn more about the virus. Um, and as for making sure that we are ready for any change in the science, many countries have been uh, buying a face mask, as have we. But the position on uh, face masks is, is unchanged. Um, we, of course, constantly, the science on that is being uh, reviewed, and um, we'll consider updated uh, scientific advice, if that's what we get, um, as, and, uh, as and when we need to and also consider the, the sort of knock-on implications that you talk about, because it is absolutely critical that the face masks that we buy are first and foremost for people in the NHS and social care and other, uh, and other places where they are clearly in uh, clinical need, and that's what we've been buying the face masks uh, for. Uh, Patrick, anything to add on that? Well, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, the, the evidence on face masks has always been quite variable, quite weak, quite difficult to know exactly, and there's no real trials on it, and uh, we will... Uh, We've undertaken a review. We'll give our advice to ministers and they'll make decisions about what to do around that. Thanks very much. Uh, Mesa Hall from The Express. Uh, thank you, Secretary of State. Uh, question first to Sir Patrick. Um, in the early stages of this crisis, you told us that social distancing measures shouldn't be introduced too quickly because of the dangers of long-term public fatigue. What is your behavioural modelling telling you now about the public's willingness to continue enduring these restrictions? And um, is the increased road traffic and people on the streets that we've seen this week, is that a sign that some people's uh, in, patience is, is beginning to wear out? And um, Secretary of State, um, as we prepare to applaud our NHS workers again tonight, um, can you tell us what progress the government has made into providing improved support uh, for the relatives of those doctors, nurses and other medical staff who lose their lives uh, in this emergency? Um, dozens of MPs have been calling for a scheme similar to that that operates for bereaved armed forces families. Is this something that you would consider? Uh, thank you very much, um, Mesa. I'll, I'll ask uh, Sir Patrick to answer the, the first on the endurance of... Uh, people support all uh, for the lockdown measures all i'd say is i think uh, it's been absolutely phenomenal how the people ha how the british people have responded when uh, when we've asked them to do something that is quite difficult uh, to um, uh, to follow those new social distancing rules um, they have uh, they have risen to that uh, and i'm very proud of them um, the um, on the on the second point um, of course it isn't just applause for the NHS, it's clap for our carers, including social care. And I think one of the good things about this crisis is the, um, is the clarity with which um, people who work in social care and do such important work there have seen that the country cares for and is grateful to them too. Um, on the important question that you ask about uh, 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 a uh, support for the families of those who've lost their lives. Of course, this is something that I'm looking into, and I hope to be able to say something more about it very soon. Patrick. Well, on the social distancing, we, we said at the outset that it's important to break transmission between households to lower the rate of transmission, and social distancing clearly is uh, the way that you can do that, and it needs to be sustainable. And I think if you look at the uh, evidence, the data, actually it looks like um, people are really doing a very, very good job on that, and it is sustaining. So I don't think there's evidence that this is tailing off, um, and it's important that we carry on with it for all the reasons that have, uh, have been said. So I think uh, uh, at the moment things look very good there, and it is reducing the R. It has reduced the R dramatically, and we suspect there will be far fewer infections in the community as a result. Final thing I'd say, Mesa, is that I pay tribute to the support that the Daily Express has shown for our health and, and care staff um, throughout this crisis uh, with constant messages of uh, support, which I know that my colleagues <coughs> appreciate. Uh, Joe Murphy from the Evening Standard. Secretary of State, um, 
it's really encouraging to see that curve for London coming down. Um, Sir Patrick said London was two weeks ahead of other regions. Wouldn't it make sense and perhaps save thousands of firms from going bust and hundreds of thousands of jobs from being lost if London could start coming out of lockdown two weeks ahead of regions who aren't so lucky at the moment? And could I just ask Professor Newton at the same time, doctors are telling us that you can't rely on certificates of cause of death to make figures on how many patients have died, sorry, how many people in the community have died of coronavirus because doctors are not always writing COVID-19 on the certificate because they don't know without a test. Wouldn't it make sense to start testing every person who dies in a care home with any sort of symptom so that the figures can be more accurate? Uh, thank you. I'll ask uh, Sir Patrick to answer the first and um, Professor Newton to answer um, the second. Um, and the only thing I want to add is that um, the <coughs> point about um, supporting those who live in care homes is I incredibly important and front of mind. And, the, uh, and we've already expanded the availability of testing uh, to those in care homes, including to asymptomatic um, uh, residents in care homes. And it's a very important part of the testing program. Sir Patrick. What, what I said was that there's more similarities than dis differences, and there may be up to two or three weeks differences in some places. So it's not that London's two weeks ahead of everywhere. There is actually a lot of similarities across a number of areas, including big urban areas. Um, and so I don't think you should take the message at all that there is two weeks difference between London and the rest of the country. There may be up to two weeks in some parts of the country. That's, that's the point. Um, in terms of releasing measures, you've only had to look at the way in which this disease can spread in cities and in urban environments to know that the release of the measure is something you want to do absolutely when you're sure you've got on top of it. That's the right time to do it and to make sure that you don't get re-importation across the country. And so how this is done, I think, is a matter for ministers to make decisions on, but you can see it's really not as straightforward as saying because you hit the peak two weeks early, you can release things two weeks early. It depends on absolute numbers and it depends on a number, no, a number of other factors. Thanks, Joe. Did you have another? You... Yes. Shall I answer the question? Uh, sorry, of course. Yes, yes. so Joe, you're absolutely right. So one of the reasons for wanting to have more available testing is to get better statistics and understand uh, these, the data better. But in fact, we have all, always been testing uh, people, residents in care homes. So over 11,000 people have already been tested in care homes. And as Secretary of State, we're rolling out very significant capacity to test all people in care homes. But in any case, Public Health England has been looking at these data carefully. So we're able to, even if the doctor doesn't write uh, coronavirus on the death certificate, we know by linking together the data that we have on the test with um, uh, national records when a patient dies, which go through to the national, a national register. So we're already able to pick up quite a lot that way. Um, and so we, there will be some, uh, uh, we, we, the will, we will have been missing a few, uh, but perhaps not as many as your question implied. Um, but it is, it, as, I mean, it's very important to emphasize the fact that we need better data in care homes, and that will help us to look after people, protect them, and save lives in care homes as well as in the NHS. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I've got um, Jody Doctico from the uh, Brighton Argus. Yeah, good, uh, good afternoon. It was 46 days between the first case in Brighton and Hove and a nursing home in the city calling out for proper protective equipment and testing after a cl uh, cluster of cases among patients and staff. Uh, what steps has the government now taken to reduce outbreaks in care homes? And have you considered limiting agency workers to one or two homes to reduce the spread between them? Uh, secondly, uh, many people are still coming down to Brighton Beach, flouting lockdown rules despite efforts from the uh, local council and police. What else can be done to limit the number of people coming to destinations like Brighton on the weekend? Well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Jody. There's a huge effort underway to um, limit the spread of this uh, disease in care homes. And I followed the, I, I followed the, the um, reports from the care homes in uh, Brighton very closely. Um, and uh, uh, as you say, um, there was a significant gap between the first positive case in Brighton uh, and the first reported cases in uh, care homes. 
And what we've been able to do recently is expand the amount of testing so that anybody who has symptoms in a care home now gets tested. And as of yesterday, uh, we've introduced the testing of people who don't have symptoms in care homes um, for exactly the sort of reasons that you set out, so that, so that everybody uh, who can benefit from a test, who is a resident in a care home, uh, can now get a test. Um, and um, the amount of work that's gone on uh, is, it, it reflects uh, the importance of supporting people who live in care homes and trying to uh, make sure that they are protected, not least because um, people who live in care homes are often uh, amongst the most vulnerable to this, uh, uh, to this disease. Um, as for people going to uh, the beach in Brighton, uh, I think the police have done a good job. Uh, I've also seen reports of the, uh, the police uh, uh, stopping people from having barbecues on the beach. Um, and making sure that people follow the social distancing rules. And uh, the rules are there for a reason, and that's because people need to follow the rules in order to protect the NHS and to slow the spread of this virus. And what I'd say to people in Brighton uh, and the rest of the country is that the measures that we're taking are working. They're supported by the vast majority of people in this country, uh, and everyone should follow the social distancing rules because that is how we come through this as a city and as a country. And finally, uh, Hannah Roger from the Herald. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Um, so I've got a question for the Secretary of State and one for Sir Patrick. So Secretary of State, um, today the Scottish Government has produced a detailed 25 page report on their exit strategy from the lockdown. Um, Nicola Sturgeon, our First Minister, said that she wants to have an adult discussion and she wants to receive feedback from the Scottish public on her plan. Um, my question to you is why has the UK government been unable thus far to produce a similarly detailed plan, which not only can be scrutinized by members of the public, but can also be used to give people some hope um, and my question for Sir Patrick is, um, the, the Scottish Government report today says one of the ways forward out of the lockdown could be to vary restrictions based on geography, professional sector and by specific um, demographics and groups of the population. Um, do you agree that this is something that should be considered and is it something that, that you yourself might take into consideration when looking at the, the exit strategy for the UK? Uh, thanks very much, Hannah. Um, we've set out the uh, five tests that are uh, needed uh, for us to um, make changes to the lockdown measures. And um, the Scottish Government's proposals are based on those tests. I think that having the um, uh, the, 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 the four nations of the UK have uh, worked together on this, um, has been important uh, thus far, not just on social distancing, but also, for instance, on testing. Um, and um, I think that the country has essentially moved together. Um, and you can see that in the flattening of the curve, which has essentially happened uh, in all uh, regions and nations of the UK together. And I think that it's important that you know, us having set out the test and now the Scottish Government having set out um, their approach, which is, uh, which is very similar, um, the, um, and based on those uh, five tests we've set out, uh, I think uh, that, that, uh, that the UK-wide approach is the best way to go. Well, to, just to echo that, the scientists are all working together and actually we're very close, uh, closely working with the uh, chair of the um, Scottish um, Science Advice Group who uh, joins us as well for all our meetings and uh, we share information and we look at all the same things and the modelling is shared so that people don't have to repeat what others are doing and so this is very much a um, unified approach to looking at the different, different um, options in, and the impact that they could have in terms of social distancing, which is the key thing. How do you make sure you reduce the contact in a way that allows the R to stay below one and allow things to return more towards normal in due course? Thanks very much indeed. That concludes the Downing Street coronavirus briefing for today.